talking today about chapters two and three in the book. If you had a chance to read it, amazing. If you had a chance at least to, to kind of look through it, amazing. If you could read it and uh, understand it, even better. Um, I went through it. I had a long weekend. I apologize if some of my thoughts might be a little scattered. Um, it's going to be a discussion anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, so you guys will be leading the or driving the the conversation for the most part. But I uh, I'm excited because today we're talking about um, two of my all time favorite subjects. And Joseph Smith taught that we're not supposed to have like hobbies in the gospel, like favorite topics that we dive really deep into and we get obsessed with, and then we start speculations and things like that. Um, if I had a hobby, it would be the pre existence of the war in heaven. And then the spirit world, because there's so much really cool stuff about that, but we don't know a lot of detail, but we know enough that that is still very intriguing. And Talmadge starts his um, his journey dis or discussing the life of Christ back in the preexistence. It's a very um, it's an eternal perspective that we're supposed to get as we re as we go through the book of who Christ is, and from his pre mortal life, his mortal life and mission, and then his what is it, post-mortal life, he, uh, there's a lot of different roles and different aspects of who he was and things that we can learn about ourselves going through that same journey before we came to earth, what we do on earth, where we go after earth, that makes all of this very relevant and to me very exciting. So the first or the chapter, the first chapter is the introduction and the second chapter starts about uh, the pre-mortal, what is the official word, let's see, the actual title. Two minutes later, it'll load. There we go. Pre existence and coordination of Christ. And it's cut off because of Zoom. Can change the window the other side. Oh, I don't like your mouse sensitivity at all. All right. Um, so, <laughs> with uh, Talmadge's words, um, there, I, when I'm putting my slides together, rather, I was going to do it a little differently. I'm going to have a lot of uh, a lot of bulk because the things he says are so profound. We want to kind of read what he says and then kind of digest and talk about what he said and what it what it means and some things I got out of it um, might help. But I want to know what everyone had a feel. As we expressed last week, super helpful if you guys have a chance to read ahead of time because we want to come back with with uh, discussions and questions and things that you guys um, things that you've learned or things that. Um, excited you or things that confused you, especially, especially as, as teachers, because I don't know very much, but I can always, you know, deflect all of your questions to Brother Adam, which is why this co-teaching thing works. <laughs> but uh, in future, it's, it's super helpful if you guys are able to kind of go through it and kind of get some ideas, because it makes a, a much more involved and exciting class. But uh, we have the first slide um, talking a little bit about the pre-existence. In this chapter, he talks a little bit about uh, the council in heaven, the war in heaven, and then the, the angles of the, the proposal from Satan or Lucifer at the time and God's plan in general and who, Je and who Jehovah was going to be. So I, I wanted to just interject two things. Here. Yeah. Real quick. So we don't really use the term pre-existence anymore. That was a term used earlier in the earlier days of the church, meaning before we existed in mortality, but really there was never a time, as we'll find out, before that we, we existed, that we didn't exist. So <laughs> we call it pre-mortal life. Right. But back in, you know, in 1915 or whatever, they kind of used a little bit different term. And then the other thing is, is that uh, very few, if any, really, maybe one or two, possibly Christian religions believe that we even existed before we were born. Right. And you might, you know, you might address that. Too. Right. And so that's it's very unique with the restored gospel. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Because in the book, as you go through a lot of the chapters, he he spends a lot of time, which is funny after this paragraph we'll read, but he, he goes through a lot of examples to illustrate scripturally what the point is, what he's trying to say, what he's trying to teach. And what I love about that is, is it really just kind of shows you how the word of the Lord really does just emphasize and and testify of itself and the different works especially in this chapter 
Um, he, he goes through Old Testament, New Testament, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants, all finding references that teach about the pre-existence or the pre-moral life. And a lot of those, I'm going to kind of, when I, when, you know, when we're going through it, I don't need, we don't need to focus on each of the examples, but it's really important to know that they're there. And when you have a chance to read through it, it's very, um, it's intriguing the things that he pulls out of stories that we're very familiar with, but we don't look at it in the same way. The, the existent, or the, sorry, I guess the existence of our pre-mortal life, that principle of the gospel is a very clear thing that was taught all throughout the scriptures. But in most religions today, most churches, even Christian churches, they don't focus on it, think about it, or maybe don't even believe it. He doesn't talk about it in this chapter, but there's even points where um, his accusers were saying that, you know, you know, what was the, the person that sinned? Or the, I'm sorry, the person that uh, was blind or wh whichever the problem was. And he said, who sinned, him or his parents? Well, he talks about later in the book where he gets to that story that the only way that he could have sinned was before he was in the womb. Like that the concept of a premortal life was always there. But uh, this paragraph, do I, do I have a volunteer to read? We're going to kind of go through a lot. Go ahead, Abby. Will you read this? We affirm on the authority of Holy Scripture that the being who is known among men is Jesus of Nazareth, and by all who acknowledge his Godhood as Jesus the Christ, existed with the Father prior to birth in the flesh, and that in the pre-existent state he was chosen and ordained to be the one and only Savior and Redeemer of the human race. For ordination implies and com comprises pre-existence as an essential condition. Therefore, scriptures bearing upon the one are germane to the other. And consequently, in this pr presentation, no segregation of evidence is as applying specifically to the pre-existence of Christ or to his or ordination will be attempted. So it says uh, in this presentation, no segregation of evidence as applying specifically to the preexistence of Christ or to his ordination will be attempted. And then this is at the beginning of the chapter. And then the rest of the chapter, he, yeah. <laughs> he does anyway. <laughs> so he's like, we're not going to sit there and try and convince you. And it's not a matter of convincing, but trying to teach these points. But then the rest of the chapter is him teaching <laughs> the principle. It's very funny. Um, but we're not, let's not, I don't want to get hung up and, and stuck on the coordination and pre-existence part. I uh, mentioned a little bit about that. We're going to come back to the concept of coordination a little bit later. But I want to move on to oh, this window. Can I quickly that. interject? Please, go ahead. He uh, is not saying that, uh, um, that he's not going to talk about those things. He's saying that right. he's not going to separate the foreordination and the uh, pre-mortal life. He's just going to talk about both as one thing. Right. Good. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that window is going to work better for me here. You can also um, minimize it if you want. You won't be able to see all the people. Oh, but then I won't know who's talking because I don't know <laughs> anyone. I'll be drowning. Before. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. So let's go on. Um, who just Was that you, Zach, that just spoke? Yeah. Okay. Zach, could you read this slide for me? Sure. Thank in you. This struggle, what? Oh. In, this, in this struggle between unembodied hosts, of the forces were equally divided, unequally divided. Satan drew to his standard only a third part of the <coughs> third part of the children of God, who are symbolized as the stars of heaven. The majority either fought with Michael or at least refrained from active opposition, thus accomplishing the purpose of their first estate, while the angels who arrayed themselves on the side of Satan kept not their first estate and therefore rendered themselves ineligible for the glorious possibilities of an advanced condition or second day state. All right, thank you. Does anything in that, in that section stand out to anyone that they want to mention? It, this is Noah. Um, I just think uh -huh. it's interesting. Hello. I, I just think it's interesting how I remember in seminary when I learned that the first estate is that premortal existence. And I don't know, like talk, going back and talking about how we've always existed before as intelligences and then as spirit bodies. I just, I think of, um, I don't know. I, 
I don't really have anything cool to say, but basically just that first estate wasn't here on earth, but having that spirit body. And I, I don't know that that concept is just really interesting to me. I don't know why, but I, maybe it's just cause it's true or something like that. But anyway, that's all. Good. What is the first estate? Remember, right? Be our spirit so body. There the, yeah, ex exactly. So in pre, whatever we're going to call it, pre-mortality, pre-existence, pre-earth life, in that pre-existence of our, our earthly um, experience, we had an option, right? To follow who or who? Satan or Christ. Lucifer, Jesus, right? Satan or Christ. I, I just used the opposite names of what you just said because I wanted to be different. In the <laughs> Christ or Satan or Jesus or, and Lucifer. Everyone look at it. So now, was it really a choice to follow Lucifer? He threw his plan out there, but was, was that really an option? No, it was more of a force. So his plan was to force us to follow the, the course of our earthly life that was going to drive us directly into obedience and thus eliminating agency, opposition, and all those things that help us grow and become like our Heavenly Father. We talked about that a little bit last week. Jesus's plan, well, it was actually the Father's plan. Jesus volunteered to fulfill the Father's plan to go down and make it possible for us to find our way back because of the, and we'll talk about in a bit, the inevitability of our, the sins, our, the fall of man, right? So, but there was still an option. So if we chose to follow Christ, or Jesus's um, plan, which was God's plan, we were choosing to follow God and follow Christ. That choice is our first estate. And what do we get for, what do we receive for following Christ? A body. A body. And where does that body happen? On earth. On earth. Okay, we're on earth with our body. That was the first estate. Choosing to follow Heavenly Father's plan and receiving a body. And my favorite part of this is that last couple lines rendered themselves, those that followed Satan, in, or ineligible for the glorious possibilities of an advanced condition or a second estate. This is the second estate. Wow. Okay. So coming here, what are the advanced conditions or what are the possibilities? What are the glorious possibilities we get from achieving a second estate? Experience. Experience. Ah. And beyond that, we have the, uh, the ability to become like our Heavenly Father one day. And absolutely. Is there anything more glorious than being like God? No. No. And everyone that received the second estate, are they going to have some slight degree of glory no matter what? Yeah. If nothing else, is everyone going to have a body? Everyone that yes. came to earth, at least, yeah. following their first estate, will achieve a physical body. And we learn from scriptures that that is a, an, an achievement of glory and happiness and joy that cannot be achieved without a body. And what happened to all the souls? We'll read about more. But what happened to everyone that didn't keep their first estate? Where did they go? Darkness. No Not body. yet. They're here. They're here. They're here but so everyone came here. <laughs> some with the body, some without a body. But it all comes down to: Did you keep your first estate or your second estate? That you're here with a body is a testament of who you were in the pre-existence. That you followed Christ. That is a powerful thing to consider the um, glorious possibilities and the advanced condition. It's an advanced condition to have a physical body to the point that those that were struggling and tempting um, people at the time of Christ, that they were so desperate for a body, they wanted to even be take, or put into swine and they didn't know how to handle that. And then they ended up drowning themselves. Yeah. And um, that's one thing we're going to talk about in a second. I think next, actually. Oh, not next coming up is why our having a physical body is a direct attack from Satan. He is so bitter about us getting a body and him being deprived 
of those uh, the, that glory and those possibilities that he specifically is at war with our physical bodies. It's very interesting. Let's go to the next slide. Wait, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. So, okay, I didn't know this. So, um, so there was souls that went into pigs? Yes, yeah, so the story with, um, with Legion, the, uh, when they came upon the man um, who was who was tormented with a lot of dark spirits in, inside of him and he was possessed and he was kind of going crazy and Christ came and cast them out of him and he allowed them to go into some pigs that were nearby and then they ran and drowned themselves in the in the in the Sea of Galilee I guess so if they don't really have a body do they actually drown and what happens to their souls well they, they were, it was they were real pigs. He, he did let them, instead of possessing Legion, who, that was the, that's what they called the guy, um, they, they instead went and possessed the pigs and, and killed themselves. So it then what happened to their souls? Oh, well, they were, they were some of the, those, the followers of Lucifer that already didn't have bodies. So, so they're, they're, they're going to be, and, and if we follow through the plan of salvation, those the, the de eternal destination of all of those that follow Lucifer is going to be outer darkness. The only which thing is, that really happened in that moment was the pigs died. Right. Yeah. The spirits yeah. did not disappear. They were still around. They just weren't in the man, and the pigs were dead. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Because that that kind of confused me. Because I thought, well, wait, how can they die if they don't have physical body well, yeah basically they murdered a bunch of pigs <laughs> okay this, this also was probably this was probably a lesson to the owner of the pigs mm -hmm. because eating pork was against the law of moses okay so do and they believe that the spirits are in the pigs that's why they don't eat pork anymore no no this no this is what that was way before yeah. with moses but uh, no, I mean, the other thing, the other point there was, is that it was forbidden by the law of Moses, at least at that time. Uh, but yeah, swine were considered unclean under the law of Moses, and largely because you couldn't really preserve the meat, you know, when they were in the wilderness, and they kept that tradition for a long time. They still do today. And we'll and we'll later in the in the course we will get to that story and and get a lot more um, understanding of it, especially in context of when it happened. But yeah, that's a that's a story in the in when one of Christ's experiences where he encountered that man, and it was actually a powerful story that um, we'll get to. Um, did that help? Yeah, thanks. I because okay, I was yeah. just like, wait a second, because I yeah remember... yeah that. They're not going to be like resurrected as pigs or anything like that. So it wasn't like their body. It's just a. They were yeah. born as pigs. So. Right. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. I know. Right. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who can read this slide for me? It's about Lucifer. Good stuff. I'll read it. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Julie. Uh, the victory was with Michael and his angels and Satan or Lucifer. They're, they're two, four. A son of the morning. Hold on, I need to make it bigger. Um, <clears throat> the uh, son of morning was cast out of heaven. Yea, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did, didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon, I, sorry, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. All right. Yikes. So there we have a scripture in the New Testament and a section from the Old Testament, Isaiah. And what I what I like about this is the language that Isaiah uses describing it, it's a remorseful song about Lucifer. Because what do, what do we know about who Lucifer was in our pre-earth life? Who was he in the council? Pretty much one of God's 
favorite angels. Yeah. He was one of the most intelligent, one of the brightest, one of the apparently one of the most charismatic because <laughs> to win over one third of the hosts of heaven is a very a big a big deal. Um, influential and, and mostly intelligent. As we think about the work that he does against us here on earth, there's nothing you can have but respect for how intelligent and careful and cunning he is. That being the case, just like any great being that falls and we see that in our lives and in family members and people that we know people from my mission i see come home and they get overwhelmed with struggles of the world and temptations and sin fall away from the church completely people that i respected greatly as a, as a missionary um, celebrities we see this kind of a, a thing happen all the time and when we hear about someone fall and be disgraced it pains us because we esteem them so high that it's a very difficult thing when we have someone that we just, you know, differently than just any person, any random person that we learn something. If we learn bad things about someone, like, well, okay, there's a lot of people that make that mistake. But when it's someone really high up in our eyes, it's a painful thing. It's Lucifer, and I believe we all knew Lucifer, I think for us to have had, for it to be such a big deal for us to choose between Christ and Lucifer, I think we all had some knowledge, and I, I believe we knew everyone, but doesn't we don't know that. Um, <laughs> well, we were up there a long time, but we all, this is a remorse in that Isaiah describes of, of his fall, and where it talks about the stars of God, that's us. We are the stars. He talks about that in the in the chapter. But the the glory that we will achieve, which I think is ironic. I mentioned this in my Sunday school class yesterday. We were talking about the war in heaven. I, I just I think it's ironic that what Lucifer wanted, what he proposed in the preexistence, was to get everyone back to heaven. But at, what was it going to cost? What was what was his prize going to be? Whose glory and honor did he want? The fathers. Fathers, right? Which is just it, I mean, it's that it's that pride, and we know pride is the universal sin, right? He wanted to have the glory and honor of the Father. We'll learn more about that in the Pearl of Great Price. The, the ironic thing is that we all, for part of that potential and that glory that we can achieve, is that we're promised that we will be joint heirs with Christ to receive all that the Father had. So we're not going to be like taking the Father's glory to be better than him, but we'll be able to be like him. That Satan following if Lucifer followed Christ's plan, he would have had everything he wanted. That's a, that's a frustrating thing. But instead, all that pride and arrogance caused him to have this fall. And that's the tragedy is that as we continue to ascend up to be like God and with him in his kingdom, Lucifer is going to be banished as low as possible. Sad. And it's a tragic thing. And we, and we still see, we see people kind of following that same pattern as anyone that follows him is going to follow that same demise. And that's the thing, too, is there are the depths of, and we're not going to get into a lot of any detail about it, but like, you know, we believe that there's different degrees of glory in the eternities, right? Celestial, telestial, terrestrial, not in that order, <laughs> right? And then there's the outer darkness, which is outside of any of that glory, which is where the sons of perdition and all these one thirds go. We don't go into a lot of you know, what constitutes the son of perdition and all that speculation, that doesn't matter. But the, or the, the aim and the goal of Satan is not to get us into outer darkness, because it's very difficult to get us there. It's just to keep us from being in the presence of our Father. That highest degree of glory as a celestial, eternal being with a resurrected, perfect body that he'll never have, all he wants to do is keep us from achieving that status with the Father. But we have the opportunity to follow Christ, which we'll talk about in our next chapter, that we will be able to achieve all of that. So Christ in this, at this point, in the pre-existence, <clears throat> can you see that, David? Yeah. Can you read that for us? Christ and Satan, together with the hosts of spirit children of God, existed as intelligent individuals possessing power and opportunity to choose the course they would pursue and the leaders whom they would follow and obey. In that 
great concourse of spirit intelligences, the Father's plan whereby his children would be advanced to their second state was submitted and doubtless discussed. The opportunity so placed within the reach of the spirits who were to be privileged to take bodies upon the earth was so transcendently glorious that those heavenly multitudes burst forth into song and shouted for joy. So there again, the opportunity so placed within the reach of the spirits who were to be privileged to take bodies upon the earth, us, keeping our first estate, were so transcendently glorious that those heavenly multitudes, us, burst into song and shouted for joy. It's beautiful. There was so much excitement and so much joy and excitement, just that the thrill of being able to come down here at some, at some level, we understood how great it was going to be to have a body like our fathers. Not quite like our fathers, but I mean, a, a body like our father had. <laughs> Later, like our fathers. <laughs> but we had all of this excitement. And so, like, as much as we rejoice for us, it's a bittersweet thing because we're seeing, a, like, a third of our brothers and sisters who are going to be outcasts and going to completely lose those opportunities for eternity. It's a, it's a very complex um, a set, a series of emotions, I imagine, from, from that war in heaven. And that's the thing about the war in heaven. It's not about, there was no battle. You know, we look at these, this art and some of the stuff I like and some of the kind of threw in here a little bit, but a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, older, you know, more kind of renaissance um, expressions of, of these ideas were there's a lot of battle gear and weapons and gore and everything, and it looks very mythological. And it's, it's really, it's intriguing and it's kind of neat to look at, but there was no physical battle because there were no physical bodies and there definitely weren't weapons, <laughs> things like that. It was a battle of wills, a battle of intelligence, or testimonies, not intelligence. It was a battle of testimony and, conv and convincing who were they going to follow. It was a battle of loyalty. That's what the war was. And we, having chosen the right side to follow our father, which was a devotion of love, caused us such great joy. I love how he expresses that. And then it goes along with what Isaiah said in the previous page. Anyone have any thoughts or questions? Are we good? Everyone online good? Yeah, I just, something when you were talking about um, how like, you know, our potential is to become a joint heir with Christ uh -huh. and basically receive what Satan quote unquote wanted. I just, I thought like, I heard I heard a thought this week where we were talking about Cain and Abel and um how like the that murder Cain basically didn't want to have to put forth you know I say the effort but like Cain wanted to take you know what I mean like not not change but just kind of like take not become one with Christ but take and so I don't know that for me that was like the same kind of idea there the parallel between Cain and Satan in that regard. I don't know. It's just interesting how like sin, it, it doesn't require faith. It, it's kind of like, and I can't think of a proper term, but it really is like taking and not expending any effort or changing or becoming a better person. It's like trying to right. bypass all of that. I don't know. It's just interesting. And yeah, that was just a cool thought how like, you know, at the end of it all, if we follow Christ, we receive all that the father hath and and basically get what Satan wanted, you know, right. anyway, it's, it's, Jesus is yeah. dope. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And that, and that was the thing when I, when I first le learned the story, when I was in seminary, um, about Cain and Abel, I was like, cause they, they both gave their sacrifice or their offering. One was the lamb and one was what he had grain, yeah. grain, right. I was thinking of wheat. And I was like, well, they both offered, and that's one was a farmer, one did the agriculture, or one did one was a rancher, one was an agriculture. I was like, why wasn't his uh, sufficient? And um, my seminary teacher had to explain to me that uh, because it was very drastic consequences for <laughs> for what the result was for not accepting that that sacrifice, and then yeah, there was murder. The <laughs> but I was I understand that, but it was a mockery of uh of the sacrifice and the con and the commandments i was like well he didn't have a sheep i was like well they're brothers and they could have exchanged or whatever they there the the potential to follow the sacrifice instructions which was all about christ 
um, it was beside, he, he completely missed the point. And there was a lot of betrayal there. And then the murder of, of his brother, it completely showed the devotion and following Lucifer as opposed to Christ. That same decision as we're talking about from our first estate, he came down here and he made that same drastic or measure. And then that covenant that he made with Satan continues to this day, which we're not going to get into, but it did follow those in the Old Testament and kind of an interesting story. And we see that in the Book of Mormon and all over. But anyway, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And Christ is dope for sure. Um, okay, here's a little more about Christ. What was her name? Calvin. Calvin, could you read? Yeah, thank you. In that August council of the angels and the gods, the being who later was born in flesh as Mary's son, Jesus, took proponent part, and there, and there was he ordained as of the Father to be the Savior of mankind. As to time, the term being used in the sense of all duration past. This is our earliest record of the firstborn among the sons of God. To us who read, it marks the beginning of the written history of Jesus the Christ. So it was explained to me that the moment Christ stepped forward in that council, that's the moment that the atonement went into effect. It wasn't until he went through the sacrifice and all the things that happened in his mortality and in the Old Testament times and everything before the price was paid, the sacrifice was made and everything and all the laws were fulfilled, all of that. But we know that the atonement of Christ is eternal, which means what? Without beginning or end, right? The moment he stepped forward and said, here am I, send me, it was in effect, that decision. And there's chapters, Isaiah 6, beautiful chapter that talks about that, that in the, pre, the pre-existence in Isaiah 6, Isaiah is describing his being called as a prophet and the coals of the atonement being pressed on his lips and making him worthy to come down in Old Testament times to be a prophet of God. And we were all there as well. Joseph Smith taught that anyone that comes or that is called to teach in, in the church was called to that in the pre, pre-mortal life. That's all done through priesthood authority. That's all done through God's command. That's all done through our desire to serve decisions and responsibilities that we took on before we came to earth. When Christ stepped forward, that was the beginning of the written history of Jesus the Christ. Um, Now, this also has a universal implication. Uh, yeah, this also has universal mm-hmm. implications with Brother Wilde just said, uh, because as we see in Moses chapter one, that uh, that God's work is to, to save all the world. And he even said the world's before, right? And the world's after. So Jesus stepping forward wasn't just like just before this earth was formed. This was well in advance as God implemented his plan with the spirits. I used to be confused, and I asked, my, again, my, I had a lot of questions for my seminary teacher, <laughs> and I asked, uh, I was like, how come they were baptizing before Christ came to earth? I was like, because the sacrifice hadn't happened yet, they couldn't be forgiven of their sins yet, and I was like, I didn't understand that, because the price hadn't been paid yet, and it had to be driven into my mind that the atonement, once it was completed, went both directions. And thus, they were able to be resurrected at the time he was resurrected. Everything was was achieved at the at that time, both ways. The only thing that changed was the formality or the formatting of the sacrifice becoming sacrament. But everything else was in full effect, both directions. Yes, the Father is omniscient. He knows all truth. So he knew, in fact, that Jesus would atone for our sins on this earth at the meridian of time. And because he knew that fact, anybody who ever lived anywhere before Jesus who would ever live after Jesus, they could still repent because that was the truth. Now, I also, I found a little clip. I thought it was uh, interesting here because I know that we have students sometimes from all over the world, different places. I know, 
uh, Milad has joined us uh, from Afghanistan. And so I looked into it and I was uh, trying to find a clip, uh, at least in Islam, is there any kind of belief that we lived before we were born? And there's actually a passage in the Quran and I wanted to share this little about a three minute clip or so about uh, what an Imam said uh, in Islam regarding living before we were born. Welcome back. Now we take your questions. If you have a question yourself, send it to us at oransspeaks.com. So Dr. Shabir, the question that we have, um, it's, it has several parts, so maybe I'll start with the first part. Is it true that Islam teaches about the pre-existence of the soul? Uh, in, in classical books, yeah, this is what how um, this is commonly uh, presented like this. Soul pre-existed, and uh, God gathered uh, all of the souls in, in the land of the souls, and uh, then eventually put them in human bodies as we have now. And uh, it is even said in the hadith that uh, when the uh, embryo develops to a certain extent, um, uh, some interpretation of the hadith, 40 days old, some four months old, then the angel comes and breathes the soul into, into the baby. Uh, and that's how we, you know, we have this body-soul dualism. That, that's classical. Okay, so then does this mean, do you teach, so the viewer goes on to ask, do you teach that mm -hmm. all souls were created in adult before their earthly life, but then God erases FM the generation of souls raised. with that's the one exception that song as we give you God gives music. the idea For a better work day, it's Rebecca here with you. And God, you didn't God know is. that, you know, well, uh, uh, The questioner here is uh, asking for clarification. Do we believe that? But uh, obviously when you think of the question, you realize uh, the difference. And others, January 20th. Belief. It would mean then that, uh, uh, though this was normally taught, yeah, that uh, we had this pre existence, and then God asked uh, Allah Subhi Rabbikum in the seventh chapter of the Quran, the 172nd uh, verse. Uh, and, and, and people said bala, they, they confessed. And this is repeated in sermons many times with the basic idea that the soul had uh, already pre existed. Also in the 33rd chapter of the Quran, it is mentioned that uh, God offered up the uh, responsibility to everything around us and everything um, uh, demurred from accepting that responsibility, the amana as the, as the Quran puts it, uh, except for uh, human beings. Human beings accepted that amana or trust and, and we turned out in the end to be uh, um, wrongdoing and, and even ignorant. Uh, so the uh, all of this points to pre-existence, but uh, the the idea of that pre-existence becomes problematic because it would mean that uh, we have no memory of that pre-existence, and and we are too being told, okay, then you don't have any mem memory. Just God just put it like that. So it, you're in this uh, earth only to remember from your previous existence that God is one, and you'll be questioned uh, by God if you turn away from that belief in the oneness of God. What I would say to that is that. Today, with the advances of science, uh, we, we, we do not think of a separate soul indwelling in the human being um, that pre-existed the, the human self. We see the um, whatever human personality that develops within us uh, to be very organic and related very much to uh, the human brain. So it would be better to think of the angel um, giving the breath into the, the human uh, baby and that developing into the human personality that we that we have now. Uh, so all of those verses and, and ha uh, hadith can be interpreted in the light of this to say that the human uh, soul is what develops from within uh, after the initial spark from the angel, and that is what we expect will survive after death. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. All right, uh, maybe that's uh, interesting or something that some of you didn't know, but it is something that we do share in common with Islam, whereas in much of Christianity, they don't believe that there was any kind of pre-existent life that we lived before with God. Uh, even in the Quran, uh, in the surah, in the chapter that he talked about, it talked about God having kind of a council, visiting with all these souls and discussing what would happen. So along with that, you know, <coughs> we know that there has been a restoration. We believe that the teachings of Christ, of God, have been restored today. And I think that we could even see that uh, even with Islam and with the Latter-day Saints that we share that common belief of having been with God. Wow. 
that's interesting too because uh, there's a it, you know talks about how the the spirit isn't all the way there for the first little bit and there's a lot of people especially in our church that believe when they have when they have children they watch their children and they think that there's a while that the, the veil is very thin for the newborns and then over time and then they forget and they behave a little differently um we had some speculations about my kids but that's all speculation <laughs> um but yeah i actually a few years ago when at the leonardo um they had an exhibit of the of the mummies exhibit that was here and i went to it and they had a a small just a description of, of a book they had it was like a like the it wasn't like the book of the dead or something but it was like a, a book from ancient egypt that they had and and it would explain what you were seeing on the, the little facsimiles um it was just a little a little you know you put your little view thing that you stick your head in and it would it just went through a little slideshow the story of that ancient egyptian record talked about us being among god and then coming to earth in a fallen state and having to work your way back to the level of being like god again and i was i was like going through my holy cow this is exactly the plan of salvation like in in great detail well very short average <laughs> detail but it was it was very exact but that's really neat thanks for sharing that brother adam so find that um can i get someone on zoom to read this one i can do it thank you Will you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the actually of Messiah's status as the chosen son of God who was with the Father from the beginning, a being of preexistent power and glory, was but dimly perceived, if conceived at all, by the people in general. And although to prophets especially, commissioned in authorities and pri privileges of the holy priesthood, Revelation of great truth was given. They transmitted it to the people rather in language of imagery and parable than in word of direct plainness. Nevertheless, the testimony of the evangelist and the apostles, the evangelists of the Christ himself, while in the flesh and the revelation given in the present dispensation leaves us without dart, dart, Sure. Thank you. I just want to just um, interject an appreciation so far for everyone that is willing to read Talmadge's language um, publicly online being recorded. <laughs> that's very intimidating and that's why I don't read. I let you guys read. <laughs> but uh, what okay. th this is so intriguing to me. What is this saying? Who can, who can uh, rephrase the main point of this uh, this section it's fascinating to me and complimentary to me not to me but to us but what is this saying did anyone pick that up basically jesus christ was chosen as the son of god prior right so coming to earth and how how was that being taught to people anciently compared to modern times or more recent did anyone catch that Talks the about first vision prophets, helps with that. For sure. And that's I think that's a big kickoff point. Although the prophets specifically commissioned in the authorities and privileges of the holy priesthood, revelation of the great truth was given. They transmitted it to the people rather in the language of imagery and parable than in words of direct plainness. So when you read the story or the, the prophets' writings of the Old Testament and even Christ teaching when he was here, talking right to their faces, performing his miracles and explaining the, the doctrine to them, they still didn't get it. They had to use a lot of um, imagery and his parables, the different ways of teaching. And he taught in different ways with different groups, and the parables came later on in his ministry. But when you read uh, Isaiah, when you read the Psalms, when you read um a lot of the, the things in the Proverbs, you read the concepts of the, 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 the Old Testament, a lot of people even look at those as like, as like myths and folklore, that they don't look at them as literal stories because maybe part of the language, but when the prophets were teaching about Christ, they weren't saying 
Jesus Christ is going to come. And here's the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Here's the plan of salvation. Here's pre-existence, spirit world, all of war, uh, paradise, prison, all that stuff. They didn't explain all of that directly, which is one of the reasons there is so much confusion among all of the churches today that are trying to interpret this uh, imagery that was so beautifully and profoundly taught. And you remember when Joseph Smith, you mentioned the first vision, after the, and during the restoration, when Joseph Smith was, was teaching, a lot of the times it was just questions people were asking him about <laughs> that imagery clarification and like what does this mean what does this mean and that's why he was uh he was encouraged to go through and to write the inspired the corrections of the bible which you know he didn't finish it but a lot of those things that he was able to clarify some of that was translation issues and some of it was just ex expounding where we get the book of moses um it helps us have a more clear understanding of what they were teaching about christ and all it does is reinforce the more direct language that prophets in our time use does that make sense now he says the um the attestation of christ himself all in the flesh again he was using parables talking right to the apostles the head guys and they were still struggling with it sometimes he'd have to explain exactly what the parable meant other times you're like, well, they're going to understand later. And we're going to talk about parables um, throughout this course. Awesome, awesome stuff about the parables. But the, and the revelations given to the present dispensation leave us without dearth, the scriptural proof. We live in a time unique to any other time where we have the gospel, not just at our fingertips, but we all carry around phones that have like the entire library of the prophets and general conferences and books like this and the scriptures and footnotes and and chapter headings and clarifications and commentaries and and infinite amounts of uh, resources from general authorities these prophets of the Lord are talking in plain English the concepts of the gospel no one's at no other time has ever had that so my question to you guys is why why are we so favored with all of this infinite clarity and plain language about who Christ is and what is the plan and who, how are we supposed to follow him? Why are we privileged to have that? Why didn't they have that in ancient times, maybe? What do you guys think? How does that make you feel to think about that? Because that's a, that is a powerful statement right here. Makes me feel stressed. <laughs> Please elaborate, Noah. Why is um, you're you're right, but why? What is that? What is that? I just think of like the potential, and if I'm taking advantage of every single you know blessing that we have on this earth at this time specifically, and I mean like to hear about, I think of like you know Spider Man with great power comes great responsibility, and I think of <laughs> all of the great things that we have. I'm like, holy smokes. I have a lot of work to do. And, you know, I, I say it kind of jokingly, but this is such a blessing. And but to Ant, I don't I don't really know why this time, because I mean, I don't know why this is the dispensation of the fullness of times, you know, because I know that yeah. we're in the latter days, but I don't know. So anyway, think, but yeah, I feel stressed. I think that's I think that's <laughs> I, you know, as you started your comment, I was about to bring up Spider-Man. I really was. I'm glad you got there first. Um, you said it though, in the latter days. What's different about us being here in the latter days? We're the people that the need last to, days. to come back. Yes. Okay. Luis, what was that? The last days. <laughs> right. We get it what, all. <laughs> what, what weight does that have? What's coming in the last days? Not, I don't mean just that Christ is coming. What does that have to do with us? Christ could have come anytime and they'd have been like, oh, it's Christ. Anytime you know, can look be at his hands and feet. die anytime. Like dying means Christ is already there in a sense because your life is up. It's not just when he comes, it's also when you die too. Right. So the second coming of Christ is either when he comes back to earth or we go to him. <laughs> so that's why people <laughs> like, there's two different ways of looking at that. But what, 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 were, you, what were you saying, Craig? What's different? Yeah, it's, Craig, we right? prepare for Christ and Power. resurrection Power. and second coming and all that fun stuff. Okay. Um, so we, we said, where there's great power is a great responsibility, like Peter Parker. What is our responsibility having access to all of this beautiful information? 
and you know having this pressure not to waste so much time but what what is it we're supposed to be doing helping gather israel and taking east the temple and performing saving ordinances thank you so josh just said proclaiming the gospel or you, you said proclaiming yes. the gospel right okay the gathering of israel that's the exact same thing temple work missionary work perfecting the saints the threefold mission of the church is the work of the lord and all of that is built around preparing for the millennium preparing for that rest or for all the rest that were to come after christ comes again we are the ones that are responsible to do that and to help us in this battle because not only do we have more access and more information who else is more or better armed in this spiritual warfare lucifer he has more weapons and methods and experience to corrupt and battle with our souls than he ever has before as well so where we have access on our phones to all of the gospel well <laughs> everything has been revealed as the, the continuing restoration of the gospel is going on we also have access to many many things that are going to rip our souls to pieces it's all about just like in the pre-existence keeping our first estate is either following christ keeping his commandments following through with that love and devotion we have to follow and serve him or following the pride of lucifer and going for that those selfish desires that we have and when, when, it break, when it comes down to it, all sin comes down to selfishness. If we strive to stay close to the Lord with all of this information, understanding so much about who he is, and Joseph Smith said that, it's, that you cannot have adequate faith in a Christ you do not adequately know. We've never had more resources to know Christ than we do now that we're not just limited to interpretations of the beautiful imagery and the, the poems and the symbolisms and the revelations and, and all those things that people had to try and put together themselves before, that we have clarity, we have a living prophet that we can hear from every month on Facebook. <laughs> you can send out a message saying, Happy New Year's, here's, my, here's how I feel about the world today. They never had Facebook to hear the prophets in the past, you know? It's so it's and so when we're when we're going through our daily lives, where's our focus and where's our attention? It becomes very important that we that we give adequate time to the Lord that we can be prepared and mindful of his work. I find that not just uh, fascinating, but also intimidating. I really do. Because then you start feeling, you know, don't get overstressed about it. <laughs> it's either, you know, it's not you're also here to, to have joy. That's the purpose of life. And doing non-stop church uh responsibilities is that's i mean yeah that brings joy and happiness in your life but that's not what we're supposed to do we're supposed to have balance right um but i love that i think that is so fascinating the way he the way he puts that and that and that does explain a lot of the the confusion and clear and misclarification misclarification mis un, in unclarity misclarity the lack of clarity <laughs> Uh, so let's just wrap up. I want to read this one because, as I said, in this chapter, he goes through many scriptural references where it clearly teaches about Christ's role and what happened in the preexistence and, and, and who he was, what happened to the council, and that it was, even though a lot of churches don't really focus on it or talk about it or maybe don't believe it, it was there the whole time. And maybe this imagery and this language was confusing to them, which is why they don't teach it. Um, it was always there. And this is my favorite uh, reference and lesson to who Christ was. My favorite scriptures of, are about Christ when he is uh, confronted and challenged during his ministry is when he testifies of himself. I always think that's the most powerful thing. My favorite book or reference in the, in the scripture in the Book of Mormon is when he, not just when he came down in 3 Nephi 11 to teach the people himself and show himself unto them, but the first words that he said is, I am that Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come to the world. His testimony of himself, boldly and proudly, more, you know, that version of proudly, but just sharing that light through his word, who he is. It's amazing. Um, Abby, can you read? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't have my cue cards. Can you, can you read this? This is one of my favorite stories. Well, it's not a story, but just example. 
to a certain look of Jews wrapped in the mantle of racial pride, boasting, boastful of their descent through the lineage of Abraham, and seeking to excuse their sins through an unwarranted use of the great patriarch's name, our Lord thus proclaimed his own preeminence. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. The fuller significance of this remark will be treated later. So suffice it in the present connection to consider this scripture as a plain avowal of our Lord's seniority and supremacy over Abraham. But as Abraham's birth had preceded that of Christ by more than 19 centuries, such, such seniority <laughs> must have reference to a state of existence and antedating. antedating that of mortality. All right. So why did I put this uh, picture of the burning bush, even though it looks cool? Or besides that, it looks cool. Why did I put that up there on this slide? Well, we need what to... Is the, go ahead. Or to like burn ourselves <laughs> in a way like we keep like melting our worldly desires pieces at a time to become more like Christ. Okay. And so as we like melt Oh, my throat. But anyways, as we like melt our bad habits, then our connection with Christ, it grows like it's a flame and we're glowing like like on sky high, like do that, his body glows. You know, and then like we glow and then it's like we got our whole shield and nothing can break this um, bubble, you okay. know, because it like helps us to be stronger. It's like with the tree with the fire, it's like the more we come our closer to Christ and become less of this ugh, world, and the more we're unstoppable. Okay, you're not wrong. Who, what is the story of the burning bush? Who encountered the burning bush? But then if you bush? go on to the context. <laughs> well, no, you know, you're, you're not wrong. But so Moses, Moses, right? Moses. And what, and who was the burning bush? Who did that signify he was in the presence of? God. God. God, who? Who specifically? Jehovah, Jehovah right? So, God. yes. Not so, Jesus, but God, right? Uh, Jesus. Yes, Jesus, Jehovah. Jehovah. So in the Old Testament, whenever the prophets were talking and, and, and being taught by and exercising the power of God, it was Jehovah. Jehovah was the God of the Old Testament. So I'm confused. God, okay, go okay God is God and Jesus, is that, I'm confused. Okay, so... In the Old Testament, the uh, Jews were praying to Jehovah, and um, it actually, Jesus Christ's pre-mortal name was Jehovah. Okay, correct. So this is a timeline, even though it looks like a stick figure in a field. So this is talking about Jehovah. Before Christ was born in zero, we had Jehovah with an H, I remember, right? Okay. Nice. They that Jehovah was Christ who created the earth, who was it that exercised, who did all of that? Jehovah, in the name of what's Heavenly Father's name, oh. Elohim. So, you had Elohim delegating to Jehovah to execute his plan of salvation, the plan of our Father in heaven, our plan of happiness was through Jehovah. So, he was the one that was working with. I hope you guys can see it. Oh, you probably you can't see that at all on Zoom. Um, he was the one that was working with the prophets throughout time in the Old Testament until he was born. So what after he was born, then who did we all pray to? Who do we pray to? Our Heavenly Father. In the name of who? Jesus. Okay. So Elohim worked through Jehovah, interacting with the prophets until he was born. When, and then that's when he all of a sudden started having conversations during his baptism, during the, the, the Lord's Prayer, where he was like in praying um, the serenity prayer, the Last Supper, all that. He was interacting with God in front of people and talking about the difference. And that's where the, the Trinity confusion happens for other religions. But Jehovah was the God of the Old Testament, including Moses. So you have Moses, and when they refer to God in the Old Testament, what was one of the one of the ways they would refer to the Hebrew God as the God of Abraham, Abraham Isaac, Isaac, Jacob? Why? 
Why Abraham? Because he was meant to be the father of all nations. Yeah. He was like the, the head before the Hebrews, right? Yeah. Okay. His ancestry or descendants, his descendants tree, <laughs> right? Led down to the time of Moses. Those people were enslaved in Egypt. Moses was called to come and said, let my people go, right? Yes. To free Israel. Interacting with the burning bush, meaning he was in the presence of Jehovah. And what did Jehovah call himself in that conversation? I am. I am. I am. Yeah. That was the title that Jehovah said to Moses saying that I'm God. And when you go to the Pharaoh, you're going to wield my power in the name of I am. You're going to say, I am sent me. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss, but he's, you know, I am sent me, let my people go. And then demonstrated all the wonders and the miracles and the powers and the destruction, the plagues to demonstrate the power of Jehovah. And that happened time and time again in the Old Testament. A lot of times there was the battle of the sorcerer battles, right? And who always won? Jehovah. Who was the only one that actually had power? Jehovah. So who was he interacting Christ with? He was being challenged by the Pharisees. And the Pharisees and the scribes and Sessions, we're going to learn more about those groups next week. Um, their, all of their, their authority, was they were bragging about, was from what? The, Brother Adams? Them being descendants in, in some kind of their, their, their religion's priesthood leadership dating back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when, remember when Christ went to Jacob's well and he was talking about how his water you would never thirst and everything, like how can you be better than our well that Jacob dug and all that? They were so fixated on these pre, or not prehistoric, but these <laughs> ancient prophets that they were forgetting who they were working with. So when Christ comes along and he says, before Abraham was, I am. And that was a mic drop. Boom. He said, I am Jehovah. You guys forgot. They're all bragging about their lineage and their authority. And he says, forget all of that. You're coming in my face and telling me what I'm doing wrong based on that authority. But you forget Jehovah. He says, I am that I am. Beautiful, powerful. And just, it, it shut them up. And of course, I don't accept it. But there's nothing more direct. And they knew exactly what he meant. It wasn't as long of a conversation as we had to get <laughs> to go through to get to what that meant. Because they knew what that meant. Were you going to share something, Brother Adams? Yeah, there's a couple of scriptures that are good about the relationship between God and Jesus Christ. Okay. And there's one in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. And that one says... And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So here we see a separation of God, God, the Father, and his son, Jesus Christ, who was the greatest of the spirits that lived before here. And who helped God with his plan gather us before we live to come to God and follow God. So that was that mission of Christ. And so God also allowed Jesus then to be in charge of creating this world. Right. Yes. And also the same Jesus would come down and live on the world that he created. He would take a body. And eventually, he would pay the price for the sins of the souls of men and help bring us back to his father, back to God. So that's in Ephesians 3, verse 9. And then there's one other one I just wanted to share with you. It's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And I'll paraphrase part of it. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed the heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The worlds, not just this earth, but all the worlds. 
and with the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty of God, of the majesty on high. So another important point here too, that we believe as part of the restored gospel is that God and Jesus are not the same person. Right. It's the father and that's his son as we are all also sons and daughters of God. But as we'll learn more about Jesus Christ, as him being the son of God, he had a very important role for all of us. Right. And we're going to, we have five minutes to go through that important role <laughs> in the whole next chapter. But I just wanted to share that, that incident because this chapter had multiple incidents that I encourage you to go read because it puts in context at different times how they were teaching and they were addressing the divinity of God or of Christ before his ministry on earth and before the world was. And that was what he was saying here is like, you guys were all fixated on Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. He said, before they were even there, before they were, he was born, I was there. I'm Jehovah. And he was saying that I'm here in the flesh, that I'm different than the father. And they, they couldn't wrap their heads around that either. But it was a very bold thing that he was, uh, that they really came after him a lot, a lot more aggressively after that. But as he said here, we're going to, we'll get more into that story later. Let me just read this last slide on this chapter. The testimony of scriptures written on both hemispheres, that of records both ancient and modern, the inspired utterances of the prophets and apostles, and the words of the Lord himself are of one voice in proclaiming the, the pre-existence of the Christ and his ordination as the chosen savior and redeemer of mankind in the beginning, yea, even before the foundation of the world. It's a powerful chapter that talks about um, who he was in the councils of heaven, the, uh, the consequences of Satan and what happened when the, from the fall of Lucifer and our role in following Christ and, well, <laughs> and how the, keeping that first estate has so much important um, potential for us, that glory, that the heavens rejoice. We rejoice from uh, the opportunities that we were going to have in coming down and receiving a body, but Christ or God knew that there were going to be some obstacles that would come in the way. What are the two obstacles that come in the way of our, from the fall of Adam, for us to not be able to be with our Heavenly Father? Sin and death. Sin and death, okay? Or sometimes you say spiritual death and physical death, but our physical bodies are going to die, so they're no longer, we're no longer like God. And sin is when we make mistakes that cut us off from his presence because no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God. So we're no longer perfect like him, and we're no longer eternal physical beings like him. So we have the, those two shortcomings, and they're a very big deal, and they were all um, seen or foreseen, and he knew it was going to happen. Um, we're not going to go into all of it, but uh, who was it that overcame those two obstacles? Christ. Christ. When did he do that? Um, okay, good. It started in Gethsemane. And then when did it conclude? When he died. When he, when he was resurrected. When he was resurrected. Yeah, he died, right. But yes, you're right. So, so those are the two obstacles. In the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross, we learn, he suffered for all of our sins. He paid the price for them, thus becoming the mediator. That's why he is between us and Elohim at this point in, our, in, the, in the plan, right? And you might even say it started when he said, here am I, send me. Right. Like we said, the atonement was in effect the moment he stepped forward. It triggered. That was the initiation of it. So, yes. but And so... He overcame sin and death, sin, when he suffered for our sins in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. And then three days, on the third day, he was, he was able to take up his own body and was resurrected. And he made it possible for who to be resurrected? Everyone. Who's everyone? Everyone who, who kept their first estate. estate. Every one of them, no matter how wicked and horrible they are, they will be resurrected because of the grace and mercy of the Savior. It's not their fault that they died. They don't, no one has 
knowing the enemy had the choice <laughs> to <laughs> not die, right? So us having that weakness, would God be merciful and just? If he was to hold that against us and not give, and if we weren't able to choose, I can't choose not to die. I don't age very fast, but I can't choose to not die. Excuse me, I'm sorry. My phone was on silence, but not my alarms. Um, so that obstacle is not our fault. Whose fault was it? It did go back to Adam and Eve, and that was the that was why that was a free gift. Christ's resurrection made it possible for everyone to be resurrected as a free gift out of the love and mercy and the the just his his love <laughs> that's all it was love and mercy right but the the second obstacle of spiritual death we have to work through him on his terms to become worthy of Elohim and we do that by having faith in him repenting of our sins being baptized by immersion by his authority and then receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, which will help us endure and follow his plan and path to be with God again. The interesting thing about that, that I, when I was giving a talk one time about the resurrection, I never thought about it before, but um, when you think about Adam and Eve, and then you think about Christ's res or Christ's the atonement, Adam and Eve first, the, the, the two obstacles, the first one to happen was sin. And then the second one was death. No, no, no. Yeah, so for, well, first they were more bothered than, and then, then they, they, they partook of the fruit and sin. But when Christ said, it is finished, where was he? What was he doing? He was on the cross. So what was he referring to when he said, it is finished? Was it the whole atonement? Because what hadn't happened yet? He hadn't been resurrected. That was, three, that was on the third day. That was later. So when he said, it is finished, he was talking about the suffering and the agony that he had to do to pay the price for our sins. He was overcoming spiritual death. So spiritual death was overcome first. And then we're taught... By the, by the prophets in great clarity in our time that the crowning achievement of the atonement was his resurrection. And fascinating to me is that when Christ came back and he appeared first to who? Who was the first person to see him? Mary Magdalene Mary in the garden. Right there when he picked up his body, he hadn't even been back to visit Heavenly Father yet. Picked up his body, talked to her first. So there's some, you know, people speculate things about that. But then who did he appear to? That was one person, and then Mary, and before that, because I, I had to go, I went through, I was so fascinated, I went through, and I chronologically looked at who the witnesses were, Mary, and then Mary with his mother, was and then some point, Peter, yes, exactly, and then the apostles, road to Emmaus, yeah. yes, then on the road to Emmaus, and then the apostles, and then he told, and who wasn't there? Thomas wasn't there. He said, I'll be back next week. <laughs> Get everyone here. And then they showed up and they like, were promised it happened. He said, I won't believe it till I see it because it was too good to be true. And then he met with the 12. They started with one, then two, then two, then 11, <laughs> then 12, and then 40, right? Well, and then he came to them again on the, on the shore while they were fishing, right? And every time he came back, his message was what? Go and tell them what? What was the big, what was the big news? Was it the loaves and the fishes? He's risen. Was it that? He had risen because that was everything. Remember, the apostles had already been on missions. They had already healed people and risen people. from. They had already done these things. This was not new for them to go in their ministry. They were powerful priesthood holders and apostles. But now he was like, go and tell them that I have risen. That is the message of the gospel. David, you're about to go on your mission. What is the, one of the biggest principles that you will share with people? Is not oh, there's Christ and we do baptism. We have temples. It's really cool. Come join our church. It's the witness of Joseph Smith seeing Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Physically, two beings that he's still alive today. 
and that they can have comfort in deaths in their families or their personal struggles in life, that he is still alive and active and effective in our lives. That's the message you're going to share. It's the same thing that he told them. Get out there and tell them that you saw me, touched my hands, touched my feet, touched my side. He finally left, and then he appeared to who? The Nephites. Now he had 2,500 people. The numbers just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And all he told them, I mean, not all he told them, he told them a lot that first day, did a lot of amazing things. But then he told them, go and tell everyone you saw me and come back tomorrow. I'll be back with part two, the second, second lesson, right? I have a question. So yes. was, okay, a friend of mine and I just had this conversation this morning. Um, so when he, during that three days, where he was being resurrected or whatever, he was dead. Uh -huh. There's been um, proof that he was in other countries, correct? During that time? So after, after his death, before his resurrection, we know that he went to the spirit world. And we know that through the Doctrine and Covenants and the, the revelations to Joseph Smith. That he went and what did he do there when he went to the spirit world he established the missionary work he didn't go down and teach the people he set up the missionary work he told the, his followers the apostles everyone that died he said okay now you go tell them so even before he came back and saw mary after the resurrection he'd already set up the missionary work in the spirit world because this was too urgent he set them off teach them the gospel how they can follow me faith repentance baptism to receive the holy ghost temple work that they'll get you know, 2,000 years from now, and teach them. Then he started coming back to here, and he first came to those in Jerusalem, and then he had the final ascension on whatever the hill was. <laughs> the, when he left the apostles, there's a painting where they're, the angels appear, and they're like awkwardly pointing up. But was it right? at a, some island like Tonga or the, someplace? Was it, didn't, didn't, wasn't he seen there? Anywhere else he went would have been after his ascension from yeah. his apostles because he came down to the Nephites and he told them. So when I told my apostles that other sheep I have, you were those other sheep. And he said, fun fact, I have other sheep. And then he left. So that after he finally left the Nephites after many days of teaching them, he went on to teach other people the gospel. And yeah, we've had revelations where well, in our revelations, there have been like things like in temple dedications and things like that, where little tidbits of um, insight was given to some of their heritage and things like that. But what was we said uh, is, is our work, the work of the Lord is gathering of Israel. He went and taught Israel, all the lost tribes, all, well, I mean all, but we, we, don't, we don't know. We don't have details on where he went. We just know he did tell them he had other sheep to to uh, visit we don't i don't know we don't, we don't have like a lot of specifics in where he went what records they have where they came from or anything like that we just know that he told the nephites that he would he had other sheep to visit and then who knows someday that's all speculation someday we may get more records of other tribes he visited you know surely they would have because he told when he came to america he was very strict about keeping records he got them right to work and uh, I'm, I'm, I can't imagine it would have been different anywhere else because he did the same thing with his apostles in Jerusalem. But, uh, but my, my, uh, my point was just that the message of, of his, of the, of the gospel, the good news, what the gospel, gospel means, was, wasn't just all the atonement and all that stuff, pre-existence, all these vague things they were teaching in, in general imagery and, and trying to teach them symbolically, <clears throat> very clearly tell them that i've been resurrected there was no vagueness about it and then they went through a lot of trials then we went to the apostasy and then was the restoration and the most powerful message of this church is that we have a prophet in our time joseph smith who saw god the father and jesus christ which is why joseph smith isn't <clears throat> up here as a god with christ we don't worship him but because of his testimony, his witness of who he saw, we know that their gospel and their church is on the earth today. And that's why we're here. 
because we have a great obligation obligation with all this power and responsibility that we have to follow that work and to share that same message. And that's going to be one of the biggest thing David's going to hit people with, the resurrection. A lot of people don't even understand or believe in that. But <clears throat> I just want to share my testimony, adding it with the chapter three. I mean, go ahead and read. A lot of this stuff is pretty um, common knowledge to us as members of the church, but he, he has a lot of interesting perspectives on it. A lot of, um, he has a few bullet lists of why Christ was the only one that could fulfill the atonement, um, the inevitability of our of sin and death and how God saw that coming. He talks about foreordination and a little bit about uh, predestination that just because he knew we would sin doesn't mean we had to sin. He clarifies a lot of those things. Really powerful stuff. Um, but what it comes down to is the chapter says we needed a redeemer. The only one it could have been was Jesus Christ. And I want to testify through the Holy Ghost, through keeping the commandments and through following him, we can all receive a witness of Jesus. And that the more we come to know him, the more effective he is going to be in our lives. And then we're going to be able to fulfill all of those, those joyous and exciting things that we were so excited about in the pre-existence to come down to be able to live our lives fully, to have joy and peace, knowing who we are, knowing where we're going and knowing how to get there and sharing that with others, which is the greatest joy that we can find is by teaching others about the savior. It's the message that the, the prophets had in ancient times. It's the message he had when he was on the earth. And it's the message that he dispatched all of his disciples out that we still are teaching today, that he is the savior and that he is our way to be with God, which was the plan from the beginning. I testify of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.